If we start to act to reform our monetary system, the money changers may do what they did in 1929 and then the 1930s, crash the stock market and use that as a smokescreen while contracting the money supply. But if we're determined to fight to regain control over our money, we can come out of it fairly quickly, perhaps in only a very few months as U.S. notes begin to circulate and replace the money withdrawn by the bankers. The longer we wait, the greater the danger will permanently lose control of our nation. But some still wonder why the international bankers would want to cause a depression. Wouldn't that be killing the goose that is currently laying all those golden interest eggs? Remember what Larry Bates said at the first of this videotape. You see, in periods of economic upheaval, in economic crisis, wealth is not destroyed. It is merely transferred. Do we have any hints as to what the money changers have in store for us? Here's what David Rockefeller, the chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank, the largest Wall Street bank, had to say. We are on the verge of a global transformation. All we need is the right major crisis and the nation will accept the new world order. So, crisis is needed to fulfill their plans quickly. The only question is when the crisis will occur. Fortunately, we probably have a little time. It's unlikely that this crisis will occur before the 1996 elections, but after that, the danger begins rising. But whether or not they decide to cause a crash or a depression through relentless increases in taxes and the loss of hundreds of thousands of jobs being sent overseas thanks to trade agreements such as GATT and NAFTA, the American middle class is an endangered species. Cheaper labor, including slave labor in Red China, which Harry Wu has heroically documented, is being used to compete with American labor. In other words, money is being consolidated in fewer and fewer hands as never before in the history of this nation or the world. Without reform, the American middle class will soon be extinct, leaving only the very rich few and the very many poor, as has already occurred in most of the world. We've been warned of all this by congressmen, presidents, industrialists, and economists down through the years. Religious leaders, too, have seen the danger. About 1898, during the time of William Jennings Bryan, Pope Leo XIII put it this way. On the one side, there is the party which holds the power because it holds the wealth, which has in its grasp all labor and all trade, which manipulates for its own benefit and its own purposes all the sources of supply and which is powerfully represented in the councils of state itself. On the other side, there is the needy and powerless multitude, sore and suffering. Rapacious usury, which, although more than once condemned by the church, is nevertheless under a different form, but with the same guilt, still practiced by avaricious and grasping men, so that a small number of very rich men have been able to lay upon the masses of the poor a yoke little better than slavery itself. More recently, during America's Great Depression, Pope Pius XI spoke of the same problem. In our days, not alone is wealth accumulated, but immense power and despotic economic domination is concentrated in the hands of a few. This power becomes particularly irresistible when exercised by those who, because they hold and control money, are able also to govern credit and determine its allotment. For this reason, supplying, so to speak, the lifeblood to the entire economic body and grasping, as it were, in their hands the very soul of the economy so that no one dare breathe against their will. But now, let's get back to our original questions. What can we do to protect our families during a depression? First of all, get out of debt if you can, even if it means lowering your standard of living. Otherwise, you stand to lose everything that is debt financed. Secondly, get liquid. 
Reduce your wealth to more liquid forms. Reduce your real estate assets, for example. If you own your own house outright, then fine. If not, then sell other assets to pay it off. For a worst-case scenario, consider putting some of your assets into old silver coins. Pre-1965 silver coins are 90% silver. From 1965 on, they are not. It's been said that during a severe depression, a single silver dollar may be able to buy your family groceries for a week. Why will old silver dollars become so valuable? Because most people are familiar with them. They know they are of an assured weight and purity. In that case, owning just 20 to 30 silver dollars might mean the difference between your family making it or not through what is likely to be the worst time in U.S. history. Other forms of precious metals, particularly gold, are usually a good way to protect extra assets during a depression, too. But there are other things you can do. You might consider foreign currency funds. Consider opening a Swiss or Austrian bank account or a foreign currency denominated bank account in a U.S. bank. If you can afford to diversify into all of them, consider doing so. Educate your friends. Our country needs a solid group who really understand how our money is manipulated and what the solutions really are. Because if a depression comes, there will be those who call themselves conservatives who will come forward advancing solutions framed by the international bankers. Beware of calls to return to a gold standard. Why? Simple. Because never before has so much gold been so concentrated outside of American hands. And never before has so much gold been in the hands of international governmental bodies such as the World Bank and International Monetary Fund. In fact, the IMF now holds more gold than any central bank. A gold-backed currency usually brings despair to a nation, and to return to it would certainly be a false solution in our case. Remember, we had a gold-backed currency in 1929 and during the first four years of the Great Depression. Likewise, beware of any plans advanced for a regional or world currency. This is the international banker's Trojan horse. Educate your member of Congress. It only takes a few persuasive members to make the others pay attention. Most congressmen just don't understand the system. Some understand it, but are so influenced by bank PAC contributions that they ignore it, not realizing the gravity of their neglect. We hope we've made a valuable contribution to the national debate on monetary reform. It remains for each man to do his duty, consistent with his state in life. May God give us the light to help reform our nation and ourselves. We say ourselves because ultimately vast multitudes of men are going to be driven more and more to desperation by the accumulation of the world's wealth in fewer and fewer hands. Men will tend to become like their oppressors, selfish and greedy. Rather, let's keep in mind during this period of reform a warning not to lose sight of greater things. As Pope Pius XI put it, for what will it profit men that a more prudent distribution and use of riches make it possible for them to gain even the whole world, if thereby they suffer the loss of their own souls? What will it profit to teach them sound principles in economics, if they permit themselves to be so swept away by selfishness, by unbridled and sordid greed, that hearing the commandments of the Lord, they do all things contrary?